Take out its Ed Road Rash bud here. Does anyone remember that game Road Blasters? That was a great game. Anyway, let's get back to it. You may remember me from shows such as Top 10 Running Shoes of 2022 and Which is the Best Running Shoe for a Cat. Today, I deliver the buzzer beater three-point shot containing another delicious round of running shoe yay or nay for you. The show where I examine recently released or soon to be released running shoes and let you know whether I'm going to pick them up for review on the channel or not. It could be that another shoe master might do the shoe a bit more justice than me. I'm not saying that the shoe's gold or it's trash, that I just might pick it up or not. So let's get to it, man. Welcome and salutations. Hit that subscribe button and tinker the bell for notifications. It helps to keep the channel growing like a succulent orange. Also, the man from Shoe Monte would really appreciate if you give this video a thumbs up like and share it with your own buddies. Danke schön. Four shoes. Let's meet them face to face. First up, an old faithful from Nike. The Pegasus. Here it is, the Pegasus 40. My word, a 40th version of the much-loved Pegasus model. The running shoe for all runners. At least that's what Nike say. They first launched this one back in 1983. A real workhorse model. It's for mile accumulating, not really one for out and out tempo. I think it's been up and down over the years, so although the last version was a real hit for me, kind of brought it back to where it should be. The 39 had a softer midsole. Certainly than the 37 or 38. It was a bit brickish, that one. It was a nice iteration. I really like the midsole and outsole there. It did everything that you want it to do from a Swiss Army shoe. I enjoyed all my miles in that one, and I think I'm going to do the same in the Pegasus 40. An upper update only here, which by the looks of all the leaked images so far, will have a nice light and flexible toe box here, and perhaps an outer texture. Not all that different to the materials we see in the Vaporfly Next% Percent 2. Does it very meshy there? There's quite a bit of breathability perhaps in that toe box. Lots of holes and the positioning of the swoosh to create an illusion that it's perhaps a bit wider and thicker towards the area where it curves upwards. Really like it actually. Might be a cool one to wear just as a sort of casual shoe as well. The reinforced lace loops and final eyelets are here as per usual and a lower profile around the ankle area as per the current 39th version of the shoe. New upper here on a tried and tested midsole and outsole unit. Sometimes that can make or break an iteration if they really foul the upper up, up, up. So it will be interesting to see if this new material does work and we get another good Pegasus. Let's hope we don't have to just sort of put it out to pasture or sell it for glue. Hopefully it's not just an update for looks because you know, this is a running shoe. It's got to be good for running in, right? Looks as if we've still got the Zoom Air in the forefoot and the heel. I think they've used Zoom Air since the Pegasus 27, so it's nothing new, really. Zoom Air does seem to be very resilient and last the test of time. Let's hope the Pegasus 40 is lighter again than the Pegasus 39. That was certainly a move in the right direction from Nike. I think it's a yay from me. I'll just be keen to test it out and see if this new one's just as good. Could be a few months off yet, though, so, you know... Don't wait up. Shoe 2. I have received countless requests for me to review the Supernova 2.0 from Adidas. 2.0, you know, whatever way you want it. I did initially throw this one out, the yay or nay, due to what must be an error on the Adidas website. It does suggest that the weight of the shoe for the Pali combo, like collab version, is 492.75 grams. I'm pretty sure that they've made a bit of an error there. When I checked, the standard version was only 278 grams for the sample size, so not entirely sure what's happened there. The difference with this shoe, though, over the others is the mix of both Boost in the heel and the Adidas Bounce midsole material in the forefoot area. It does very much remind me of the old Boston models, you know, before they kind of made it into a big brick. Boston 9 was an absolute winner there using Light Strike and Boost. It's had this really nice combination there. The balance was just right. I think Boost still has a place in shoes from the countless mentions I get in the viewer comments of my videos. Those with bigger builds perhaps than I seem to enjoy the Boost material for its resilience and stability over distance. 
where more fragile foams just can't live up to the pounding. Remember, those very compressive foams are not for all of us. There's a word we must always remember, and that is empathy. The upper here seems closer to the Adi Zero SL than other more minimal Adi Zero offerings. There's a touch more padding there around the heel area. Certainly one of the more plusher designs that we've seen from the Three Stripe brand of recent time. It certainly seems to be a more standard running shoe design than some type of opportunity to embed more super foams into proceedings. As such, I can see people picking these up who really enjoyed that old Boston model. I really enjoyed that last pre-energy rod Boston model. It was really pleasant to run it. And the Supernova 2.0 seems to be a continuation of that shoe, perhaps. As such, if I can find a reasonable discount for this one, I will pick up the Supernova 2.0. So it's a yay this time around. Just a quick heads up on a video that I'm going to be doing in the near future i'm going to grab the cheapest running shoes i can from four different brands and put them up against each other perhaps something from nike adidas reebok and asics and see which has the best performance for the money do you need to spend loads of money out on these shoes probably not they end up selling them for next to nothing don't they in the sale so they can't be expensive to make i suppose if there's a specific model that you'd like me to add into the mix for this one let me know down in the comments an interesting one next it's the only model of its type in the UK at the moment, although there are some other ones in other parts of the world. I'm talking about the Fresh Foam X 1080 V12 Permafrost. This special version of the New Balance 1080 V12 uses a water repellent treatment on the upper to make it one great looking shoe, but also a functional one. This should at least stop water entering in the shoe from the sides and hopefully keep your feet a little bit drier in that wet UK weather or wherever else you may be on the globe. There's some reflective content on the shoe too, which will help you be seen in those lonely winter runs before sunrise or after sunset. Just starting to get a little bit lighter now when I get home from work. So I might be able to get a few more sessions in in the evening without my headlamp. The outsole's also been modified to improve its performance in wet conditions. It uses the New Balance Hydrohesion Technology rubber rather than the standard stuff to give you more traction when you need it. I do recall the standard 1080 being a little bit slippery actually, especially when you wore it in some wetter conditions on smoother terrain. Hopefully this is improved upon in the Permafrost V12. Also you got a toggle lacing system there to make it a little bit easier to get a decent lockdown if you've got your mittens on. Now there's one big stumbling block here and it's the fact that the shoe is 165 earth credits here in the UK. I mean it looks really beautiful, I think it's a great shoe. It's sort of shoe that I could see Kafuzi trying out at some point. It's kind of got that storm shadow vibe about it and it will fit right in with Mike's kind of look and everything. So I think he should review it. When you see the standard V12 discounted down below £100, it just makes this one seem a little overpriced, I suppose. It's also a weighty number coming in at 290 grams for the sample size. So it's going to be a hefty shoe if I get it in my size. It's not something I'm gonna try out a uh, nay for the 1080 V12 permafrost. I just wish that they'd release the Fuel Cell Rebel 3 permafrost over here in the UK. I think it's available in other countries, but not here. Give us more winterized models, New Balance, and I shall test them. Last shoe up now, number four. It's not one shoe, it's a whole bunch of shoes actually. And I've been waiting for these for a long time. The Mazzy are a new brand from the USA. who are about to launch their shoe lineup and I've been really excited to test them out for ages. Don't know how long I've been waiting, guys. The Z40 is specially engineered for running between 6 minutes 15 and 7 minutes 45 per mile. So that's about 3.55 and 4.45, I think. Now, that is ideal for most of my racing and training. All the Vimazi shoes are pace-tuned, meaning they have a specific type of foam in the heel to help absorb impact, then a four-foot pod, which I'm expecting to be very responsive and quick to return to its shape. We've got about 29 millimeters of stack height in the heel, and most of their shoes, I think, have a five millimeter drop. I'm expecting the Z40 to be something along the lines of uh, Adios 6 or 7, perhaps, with a less narrow feel in the arch, 
and more toe box room. Everything that I've read so far from my buddy John over at Vimazzi suggests these are gonna absolutely hit the spot for me. It's so refreshing to see somebody kind of adopting a new ethos really with shoe design. I'm just sort of throwing mud at the wall and seeing what sticks there. Really trying something different here. There's a whole selection of different pace tuned shoes, something for every runner, rather than a whole load of different shoes for different sessions. Quite a novel approach and one I'm very excited to experience. That's a big yay for the Vimazzi Z40. I think it's coming in February 2023 for pre-orders. I do believe that's only in America to start with. Hopefully I'll be able to grab a pair from John so I can test them out in the very near future. That's all four models for the yay on A for today. Let me know your thoughts and your opinions down in the comments. Musical interlude time. Now, I was watching a documentary the other day about Britpop and sort of 90s indie music, and it made me reminisce a little bit about the good old days, you know, when we were still watching VHS videos, and it costs like a fiver to go and watch Radiohead, that kind of thing. A great album that kind of bookended the 1990s that hardly anybody knows about is one by Bernard Butler. It's called Friends and Lovers. I saw him perform some of these tracks, and they were fantastic live, but the album just sort of got missed, I suppose. It just sort of got bypassed by people. I didn't even know it existed. I think it was right around the period where Creation Records sort of got sold off or something, or they closed it down. I can't remember right now. There's some great tracks on here and some quite vicious guitar playing from Butler. Friends and Lovers has got a great riff and the solo later in the track is just wild and unkempt, like a man who's eaten too many energy gels. I really love track five as well, which is called You Must Go On. It's kind of a really nice, poppy, guitar-y, positive track. I really like the psychedelic Has Your Mind Gone Away as well. Lots of beautiful echo and wah and reverb. Beautiful groove to that track. I think if you liked the tune called Autograph, which was from Bernard Butler's first album, you'll certainly like Has Your Mind Gone Away. Go and check it out, guys. The fantastic album from Bernard Butler, Friends and Lovers. Thanks for tuning in, people. I hope you enjoyed today's yay or nay. Hit that subscribe button, click the bell for notifications. Also, give this video a thumbs up, like, and share it with your running buddies. My name's Ed Budd, and I'll be seeing you.